My name is Dita Bruku. I'm the city councillor for the district. I have been since uh, 1990 with a small intermission. Um, I'm accompanied by Mayor Mitchell Brownstein, Councillor David Torchman, Councillor Mitch Kajavsky, and the family, of course, um, Natanya, who we sure. all know. Sure. Pardon? Joël Etienne. Joël Etienne, Maître who's Joël his Etienne. son. Maître Joël Etienne, I think you, you live in Ontario right now, Hello. Toronto. And Michaela, Gilad, and their children. <laughs> and, and their children. This little space here is midpoint between the TBDJ, the synagogue where uh, Gérald used to, um, you know, worship, pray, walk to on high holidays and on Shabbat, and I believe you used to live uh, on Glencrest even uh, at the time that he was that he was alive, and that period of time to me seemed like a very long time. And then when I asked Natanya, how long was he really living here? She said, well, only from 2000 to 2008. But in her words, she says we took up a lot of space. So I I kind of you know agree with that because. There he was, you know, this tall, strapping man, you know, handsome. And he would say, like, well, what, what, where is he coming from? Like, all of a sudden, you know, we have this new member uh, of our community and, and, and of the, the, the neighborhood. And I really didn't know him very well. I just admired him. I spoke to Natanya quite often. And when she approached me a couple of years ago she said look he wrote many books and he had a very turbulent childhood you know in Haiti and it was very difficult for him to adapt and he was so full of love and 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 wanting to to share his experiences and also to promote human rights and to promote all the values that he had learned over the years I, I realized that maybe we could do something, and this is what we've decided to do. It's a small commemoration. It's a plaque. It's a quiet place, midpoint between his home and the synagogue where people can reflect, maybe read his books, sit and listen to, to the birds. And I want to share with you just two short chapters because you have to wonder, like, what was going on in his mind, really, with all this turbulence that he lived through um, in his in his early years. So I'm going to read you from one of his most um, famous uh, books called Gérard Etienne, Crucified in Haiti. And it's very short, but it really captures what I feel is the the emotional impact that he's had. So... Despite everything, he, so I'm reading now, he realizes that he has too many worlds swirling in his head. They crowd against one another. Too many worlds fill his cracked brain and dissolve like spit in water. What can he do? Imagine situations that he would like to live in, states of consciousness that he would like to experience. Pretend to be important instead of being deep in the woods, instead of praying, instead of holding out a porcelain plate and waiting for a star to fall into it, instead of repeating spells to invoke the portrait of Beelzebub, long lost in the books of scientists through some midnight incantation. On the contrary, he thinks that these worlds allow him a form of perception that the Negre of Haiti dislike. These are boundaries between those worlds and life. It's like returning to the starting point. It's like lying down in a church of saints and then waking up in a hut of crazed spirits. He travels through Port-au-Prince. The more he is aware of walking, the more he walks backwards. To him, walking means counting his steps the way a shopkeeper counts his money after a day's work. He walks backwards so that the strong wind can't knock him over. He can see where he is going through an eye stuck to his back. He talks to himself, but he isn't delirious. He speaks as he does when he addresses the crowds and urges them to take up the revolution in order to overthrow the power. So that was one part that I really felt evokes some of the emotional turmoil 
that he writes about. And here's one other, and then I'll, we'll, we'll unveil the plaque. He is buried in his thoughts. His disgust at being a negre makes his mouth water. I mustn't leave, he says. The whites are making their country. I too must make my country. A type of tree is already growing in his head. Each limb is a branch of the government that he wants to give Haiti, a government he thinks made up of peasants and workers. He is thinking about the future of his country, a country that he damns but that he also thinks of as a woman, a woman one loves too much to hate, a woman who one hates too much to love. He's pulled back and forth between the love of his country and the rage of hating it. There are too many scars, too many wounds for everything to disappear in a single day. It takes time, he thinks. He's pulled back and forth between the thought of making Haiti disappear, having it wiped off the face of the planet Earth, and the thought of making it prosper and bloom. So you see here the tension, the contradictions, and all the emotional turmoil that he, he lived through. And I, I, I couldn't even read the beginning of the book as it was so difficult. But as I got into it, you really start to understand more about this man and what he went through. Anthony wants to share with all of you that he admires Mr. Etienne because of his dedication to human rights, which began in his home and extended to the world. Mr. Etienne arrived in Canada and worked as a nurse, a journalist, a poet, and an editor. The golden thread that unites his work is that he helped people, in particular through the power of his words and ideas. He provoked thought not only in French, but in Portuguese, Portuguese English, and German as his works were translated into these languages. Anthony est content et fier que la famille Etienne ait choisi la ville de Conseil-Luc pour établir leur foyer et que la ville a décidé d'honorer Monsieur Etienne, un homme talentueux et le mari et le papa adoré de Madame Etienne, Michaela et Joël. Merci. Hello, I'm, uh, my name is Joël Etienne. I'm here on, on behalf of the family. I should apologize in advance as I am from Toronto, <laughs> but, but my heart is in Côte Saint-Luc. I should say, I, I, would, I would specifically uh, wish to give my, my warm thank yous to uh, His Worship, uh, Mayor Brownstein, and Councillors Burku, uh, Councillor Torjman. Thank you very much for your support. Kajavsky. And Kajavsky. Uh, thank you extremely. Uh, ex thank you, thank you, thank you. Tadaraba. Thank you for your support. Uh, the family is uh, could not be more um, overwhelmed by uh, by this gesture and this effort. Um, a few words about my father. Um, any anybody who knew Gerard knew that he loved Côte Saint This is a special place. It's a very diverse place, but at the same time, also has a strong Jewish community. Um, this is the this is the sidewalk he would walk to go to synagogue on every Shabbat. He was from Shabbat. He would walk to Shul, and um, Shabbat in Côte Saint as far as I can recall, is a very special time. You have uh, I see I see in the citizenry and in his colleagues. Uh, tons of people who punched above their weight, who made uh, amazing contributions in science, in finance, in politics, and uh, people who people who work 24/7. But on Saturdays, they would all congregate to go to shul. Um, I on, on my drive up to tr from Toronto to Montreal, I was also also thinking of Dr. Mark Weinberg, who was an acolyte of my father, a close friend, and who we lost not such a long time ago, and uh, who was responsible for saving saving you know millions of lives uh, with respect to HIV and AIDS so it, it certainly certainly my perspective that there should be some a lot of further plaques honoring a lot of very good people uh, who uh, who represent this community and who've done who've, who've made their difference in this community a few words about my father um, I think I think I can exemplify Gerard by saying that he was a, a unifier he hated division his, his, his vision for Haiti was uh, a Haiti that would finally uh, make it to first world standards and, and join in the North American community. Um, 
in a, in a, ma in a manner that would pr give it the, the dignity that it deserves. Um, a little anecdote. On, on the night that Barack Obama was elected president, I should advise that my family has turned a little bit to the right over the years. So my father sneaked into the bathroom and called me. In I was in Toronto at the time, and he said, don't tell your mother, but I think I'm pretty happy about this. <laughs> So that was, that, was, that was Gerard in a nutshell. Um, he loved everyone. He would always give to people on the street. He, would, he, would, he was a non-judgmental person. There's not a person on any, of any creed, any background that he wasn't, uh, wasn't, wasn't close to, didn't want to be close to. And people really resonated to him. I'm, just, I'm very warm by the crowd that's here today, but I can see a lot of his friends and people that, whether people had a little bit of contact with him or a lot of contact with him, um, uh, he certainly left an impression. Um, Gerard would be very concerned about how things turned out since he passed away in 2008. Um, certainly he did not live to see the earthquake in Haiti. Uh, things are very difficult in Haiti and so to our elected and aspiring politicians, when you have time to think about Haiti or act in, in its favor, uh, please keep it in mind. Uh, he would also be very concerned about the fragmentation of our, of our state of politics. Why, while my father was a revolutionary and a man of very strong words, he certainly believed in the dialogue and the, um, how, would I, how should I say, this, this Western contract uh, that was created at, at the outset of the Second World War, which was on the left we had the FDR uh, Rooseveltian New Dealers, New Deal people, and on the right we had the Churchillian, Eisenhower, small state individuals, and in, in respect to our state of politics, nothing veered, in North America certainly, nothing veered more to the left than that, and nothing veered more to the right than that. And today what we see in, in the state of a very, very difficult political discourse with a lot of wedging and a lot of division, I, would sh I, should, I should certainly would like to note that my father as a political writer would be absolutely very concerned and very upset about the state of the discourse. He would be very upset about, about laws that tell Jewish people that they can certainly work in certain professions and not in others if they want to keep their hats on their heads. Um, and people, people of other creeds and backgrounds who would be affected in the same fashion. This is something that he would not tolerate. So, um, having said all of that, um, let us celebrate him, his life, and this amazing constituency that has allowed for this enduring uh, monument in, in, in his favor. Um, I thank you very much. Je vous remercie énormément et uh, j'apprécie beaucoup. Thank you. Tadaraba. Um, merci à tous d'être venus. Uh, we are coming to the end today of Yom HaShoah. And um, I just want to keep in mind um, everybody who perished, everybody who survived, and everybody who will overcome. Why Côte Saint-Luc was so special to my father is because my father was also a survivor. And all the survivors that my father encountered, the survivors from the Shoah, the survivors from domestic abuse, the survivors of any kind, they all understood him. They never saw his color. They never saw his religion. They just saw his will to survive and continue. So for the second generations here and those who have third and fourth generations, our blessings and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. So uh, we're going to move to the unveiling of the plaque. But first, I just want to say a very brief few words. We're so happy in Cote St. Luke that we're able to do this in our city. We stand for human rights. We always are never afraid to be leaders. Uh, I'm sure all of you know what we're doing now with uh, Bill 21 and trying to lead on that and see what we can do to affect change and ensure that that bell never passes because we know that in Cote St. Luke we're always going to hire individuals irrespective of the clothes that they wear, the religious symbols that they wear, and that we want that to be the case throughout the province that we all love and chose to live in. And it's great for me today to see so many people from TBDJ. I grew up on Borden, and many of the faces that I see here are individuals that I was able to enjoy with as I was growing up. I had my bar mitzvah there, and uh, my mom still lives on Borden. So it's really great to see so many of you here today. 
We will unveil the plaque. It's a beautiful plaque. I'm going to read uh, it in English. Councillor Torchman's going to read it in French, and then we'll continue uh, with a short program. So the plaque reads, Gérald Etienne was a linguist, journalist, professor, human rights defender, and prolific writer of poems, novels, and essays. Writing for me became a combative act, the need to fight against injustice, and it imposed itself on me imperiously. Gérald Etienne was born and raised in Haiti. He wrote his first poems at the age of 13 and performed them on radio. At age 15, he left home, moved to the capital of Port-au-Prince, where he took part in an uprising against the despotic regime of the country's military ruler, Paul Magloire. Etienne was arrested in prison and tortured before being released. In 1958, Etienne started his career as a journalist, teacher, and writer. In 1959, he took part of the plot against the new regime of François Papadoc de Valier, for which he was arrested and tortured a second time. Upon his release, Etienne published in rapid succession four books of poetry and two literary essays and found himself a cultural and literary leader within his country. In August 1964, Etienne fled to Canada as a refugee. Upon his arrival in Montreal, he taught and worked as a reporter. In 1965, he published Letters to Montreal, his first Canadian book. He continued to publish, and his work was translated into English, Portuguese and German. In 1967, he married Natania for a worker who he had met at a Université de Montréal. Mathieu and his wife had two children and moved into Côte Saint Luc, where he became a member of Congregation de Ferth Beth David Jerusalem. Mathieu earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from the Université de Montréal, 1968, a PhD in linguistics from the University of Strasbourg, 1974. From 1971 until his retirement in 2001. He was a journalism professor at the Université de Monkland. He also wrote a column for Le Devoir. Throughout, he continued his struggle for sustainable democratic change in his Haitian homeland. He died on December 14, 2008. Gérard Etienne était linguiste, journaliste, professeur, défendeur des droits de la personne et auteur prolifique des poèmes, des romans et d'essais. Écrire est devenu pour moi un acte de combat. Cette nécessité de lutter contre l'injustice s'est imposée impérieusement sur moi. Gérard Etienne était né et a grandi en Haïti. À 13 ans, il a écrit et interprété ses premiers poèmes à la radio. Deux ans plus tard, il quitte la maison. Il déménage à Port-au-Prince, la capitale nationale, et participe aux manifestations contre le régime despotique du dirigeant militaire Paul Malgoire. Étienne était arrêté, emprisonné et torturé avant d'être relâché. En 1958, Étienne commence une carrière de, jo de journaliste, d'enseignant et d'écrivain. En 1959, il participe à un complot contre le nouveau régime de François Papadoc du Valier. À nouveau, il est emprisonné et torturé. À sa sortie, Étienne publie rapidement quatre recueils de poésie et deux essais littéraires, devenant ainsi un leader culturel et littéraire dans son pays. En août 1964, se retourne vers le Canada pour trouver exil. À son arrivée à Montréal, il enseigne et travaille comme journaliste. En 1965, il publie « Lettres à Montréal », son premier livre canadien. Il continue de publier et, et son œuvre est traduite en anglais, en portugais et allemand. En 1967, il épouse Natania Furwaker et, se, et il se rencontre à l'Université de Montréal. Le couple a eu deux enfants, s'installe à Côte-Saint-Luc et devient membre de la, de la congrégation Tiveret Beth David de Jérusalem. En 1968, Étienne obtient un baccalauréat en, en art de l'Université de Montréal et en 1974, un doctorat en linguistique de l'Université de Strasbourg. En 1971 et jusqu'à sa retraite en 2001, il enseigne le, le journalisme à l'Université de Moncton. Il a aussi écrit une rubrique pour le devoir. Tout au long, au long de sa carrière, il continue de, à se, de se lutter pour le changement démocratique durable dans son pays natal d'Haïti. Il est décidé le 14 décembre 2008.